it's not all pastries and boat trips in the state of Denmark. Okay. okay, don't step in front of the cameras. Yeah, just... There is something rotten going on here. Okay, we'll see you later. Could you please take the 700,000 Muslims from Denmark, just take them with you to your neighborhood in Australia? The country that famously saved its Jewish population from the Nazis in World War II has turned against its minorities. Yeah, they call me ninja, but also terrorist um, and a lot of other stuff. Freedom-loving Denmark is having an identity crisis. When do you feel Danish? What is Danish? What feeling do you have when you're Danish? It's nudging the high 30s in Denmark today, and our producers had the frankly inspired idea of sending me to a cosy 17th century Danish tavern in the countryside for four courses of prime Danish pork. So hot. <laughs> you don't have an air conditioner? <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen quite so much pork in my life. The choice seems to be pork with eggs, pork with fish, or pork with pork. But pork in Denmark these days is no laughing matter. I've come here tonight to meet a Dane who's very proud of this tradition. Just like you said, it's really hot. OK. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Frank Norgard is a local politician who takes pork pretty seriously. Yeah. Right. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Skål. <laughs> Skål. Nice to meet you, Frank. Frank is a member of the right-wing Danish People's Party. So can, can you tell me what all of this is? What am I eating? You're eating uh, uh, pork. Yeah. <laughs> I got that bit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> For Frank, what's served up on plates is now a matter of national importance, even national identity. We have to uh, be aware of uh, who we are and, uh, and uh, what we are, are going to mm. in the future. Yeah, right. When a local kindergarten took pork off the lunch menu because Muslim parents didn't want their kids near it, Frank and many others were upset. We think it's a, a part of, uh, of being Danish. His council passed regulations which in many ways reflect a broader seismic shift underway right now in Denmark. They're forcing pork to be offered in all public institutions. I will eat pork from now on to my death, <laughs> <Right>. but um, <laughs> I also uh, fight for that uh, my children and uh, their children uh, will be able to uh, eat pork in, uh, in daycare, in um, elderly centres, uh, everywhere. Do you feel like, as a politician, you've, you've sort of targeted one group of the community and said, you know, you must live like us? If, if you want to be integrated and accepted, they must also accept the way we live. Things are pretty free and easy in the capital, Copenhagen. It's midsummer and just about the whole country's on holiday. Denmark led the way in being free, the first country in the world to legalise porn. This place is every bit the Scandinavian stereotype. Denmark is probably about as close as you can get to a high-functioning society. Everything here just sort of seems to work. They're healthy, they're wealthy, and officially, some of the happiest people on Earth. But something quite radical is happening here. This country has introduced some of the most draconian laws on the planet, targeting migrants and Muslims. So, 
how did this country of fairy tales and great design and tolerance find itself here? For all its historic charm, this is a very modern, dynamic place. Denmark's been on a real journey in recent years. And so today, I'm going on one too. Yeah. <laughs> you say hi. Oh, oh, mm -hmm. Nice to meet you. Seatbelts on. It's okay. Meet Ellie Joker, stand up comedian, rapper, Muslim. And the music you've just been hearing, that's her. That's uh, a convenient name for a comedian. Yes, Joker. I know. <laughs> that's your real name? Uh, yes, that's my real name. Imagine. Ellie stars with her pink taxi in a popular YouTube series. Talks to conservative Muslims and right wingers, prominent people with a point of view. In the pink taxi, I drive around people that I find interesting, people that has a story, people that has something they want to share, um, and I take them for a ride. Very often these days, the big topic is migrants. In this small country of nearly 6 million people, around 700,000 have arrived in the last 40 years. Around 300,000 are Muslim. And a lot of Danes have now decided they don't like it. Some, like this extremist politician, Rasmus Paludan, are spinning the numbers and calling for Muslims to be expelled altogether. How do you handle it when it's people that, for example, don't want you in the country? People that don't like Muslims, don't like migrants. Are you I, happy for them to get in the car? Yeah. I meet people that are different than me most often, and I try to get to the bottom of how did they become extreme Muslims, uh, extremist, uh, uh, right wing, or whatever. Does it sit comfortably with you? that but some of them don't even want you here. You have to remember, like, one thing that is very important is to remember is I was brought up in a democratic country. And if they have an opinion about they want me out, then I challenge them and say, so, if you want me out, how do you want to throw me out? And then when you talk to them, you kind of find out that they don't really have an idea, they have a wish, or they're just angry about something else that is bothering them. Massive fractures are appearing in Denmark's once cohesive society. Australia? Yeah, that's us. Excellent. <laughs> Hi. Hello. And Rasmus Paludin is a symptom of that. Okay, he leads an extreme right-wing political party. It's called Strumkurs, which means basically hard line. Today, he's standing in a quiet park in a multicultural suburb of Copenhagen. This has got to be one of the most absurd things that I've ever seen. There are riot police everywhere, even in vans down the alleyways. And inside two rings of police tape is a fully grown man making social media content claiming that he wants to express himself. I was a very, um, um, very famous person during the uh, election in Denmark. I guess I still am a pretty famous person here. Um, and that means that many... Um, religious fanatics, um, Islamic terrorists and such, they want to kill me because they think I have, uh, I have uh, desecrated their Quran uh, in different ways. This seems to be how Rasmus works. Do something provocative like throw a Quran in an area with a big Muslim population, wait to see what happens and then create some content to feed into the alt-right online stream. He stages these stunts regularly. In April, he did it, and riots flared across Copenhagen. In the first four months of this year, he cost the Danish taxpayer more than $9 million in security costs. And while he failed to win a seat at the election, it has put him on the map politically. He scored enough votes to secure electoral payments of nearly half a million dollars a year for the next three years. 
But you know when you throw that, that that's highly offensive to, to Muslims of all varieties. Yes. So what's the, what's the intention? The intention is to explain to them and make them understand that that is a premise of being a citizen in a democratic society. Mm -hmm. For instance, when they tell me that they're just as much Dane as I am, I find that extremely offensive. Even but if I, they're born here? Well, that doesn't matter. But isn't someone born here that's a Danish citizen a Dane? No, 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 no. Uh, the Danes are an, an ethnic group. Right. Uh, and, and we are, are hailing from the Germanic tribes that came here many hundreds of years ago. We're an ethnic group together with the Swedes and the Norwegians, right. and, and to a lesser extent, the Icelanders and so forth. Now, nothing much happens here today. Rasmus packs up and leaves, and so too do the police. But as we hang around to film the area afterwards, we get a glimpse of how fragile it is here. And I guess that shows that underneath this very friendly face that Denmark shows you, there's something much darker at play. What is it you don't understand? You, you know you're filming the same, the same way as before? Why, why are you... Kind of it's a public this? space. A group of extreme leftists, anti-fascists appear, almost out of nowhere, to let us know we're not welcome. And you don't have any plans to... Touch the camera. Just, OK, let's just get out don't of here. Don't film me. Okay. okay, don't step in front of the camera. Don't just, film me. Let's just... OK, we'll see you later. Oof. We can see how quickly things turn in Denmark today. That was really just probably five minutes, I think, since the police left the scene. And those people were really angry and really agitated. Um, and I've got to say, pretty threatening. Um, and for all of the things that Denmark projects itself as, as friendly, as open, as tolerant, uh, I guess it's that kind of thing that obviously exists not very far below the surface. Political change, a bit like the weather in a Danish summer, is sweeping through here quickly, at both national and local level. Now, we're not just talking about a few tweaks to policy here and there. We're talking about a wholesale change in the way that Denmark views migrants and Muslims. And last year, this country celebrated passing 100 new laws reflecting just that. Among them, strict new controls on all migration. They're even offering money to people already here to go back to where they came from. The children of migrants are being put through Danish cultural training from the age of one. There's an effective ban on the burqa and the niqab. And migrant areas are being officially designated ghettos and earmarked for bulldozing. The burqa ban was introduced to encourage integration, but it's pushing some people quite literally behind closed doors. Hi, Chef. Yes. Thank you. Salam alaikum. Today, I'm going to meet Aisha. She's 20 and was born here in Copenhagen to Turkish parents. The face scarf is called um, a niqab, and the head scarf, which I wear around my face, is called a hijab. Yeah. Tell me, how did you decide to start wearing the veil? Uh, I started wearing, wearing the veil uh, two or three years ago, and I started wearing it because I wanted to get closer to God. It's like a sign of dedication and love for Him. Aisha says no one, certainly not any man, has forced her to do this. But the conscious choice she's made is having a huge impact on her life. When some look at me with hate, you can see it automatically. For some, they are you with hatred, but they also say stuff, uh, say uh, mean stuff and racist stuff to you. Yeah. Like what? Uh, like um, ninja, <laughs> but that's the that's the you know cute one. They call you a ninja. Yeah, yeah, they call me ninja, but also terrorist, um, and a lot of other stuff.
Under the burqa ban, if she leaves her home wearing the veil, she faces fines starting at $200. I used to work and go to school before this ban, but now I'm all, all, like, all the time at home. And how does that make you feel? Makes me feel sad because I was born and raised in this country. I love this country, so I think it's important that we remember that we are in Denmark. And in Denmark, there's freedom of speech and freedom of religion. I have the right to practice my religion and wear the clothing that I want to wear. And Aisha's right. Denmark is a place where freedom is paramount. This is a country that prides itself on equality and tolerance. So the current push against Muslims and migrants is provoking some serious soul searching. To see how they got to this point, it might be worth going back to where it all began. At the doorstep of a little church in the Danish heartland in a giant glass case is a landmark from the Viking era. It's called the Yelling Runestone. The big rock that everybody comes here to see is known as Denmark's birth certificate. King Harald Bluetooth had it struck back in 965 AD. And crucially, on the back, there's a depiction of Christ and a crucifix. And that symbolised that this had become one united kingdom that was Christian. Now, it was Harald's great powers of communication that had united what had been warring tribes. And it's for that same reason that some 1,000 years later, we named some new technology after him, Bluetooth. Denmark remained largely white and Christian for 1,000 years, up until the 1960s, when the first wave of migrants arrived, mostly from Turkey. Hey, Ellie. Hi. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm very good. Nice to see you. Some, like Ellie's family from Iran, were pretty much pioneers. Don't hear the cyclists. <laughs> so where are we going today, Ellie? We are going to see my mom. Your mom? My mom. OK, tell me about your mom. My mom is the coolest woman in the world. Right. Uh, she, yeah, my mom is Persian, of course. Yeah. Um, and she's uh, one of the strongest women I know. Ellie's mum, Etty, arrived here when she was 28. She started from scratch, building a new life with her young family. So this is it? Yeah, we are making it for 100 uh, persons for tomorrow. 100 people? 100 people. Turning up? Yeah. She's a wedding planner now, a business she started 18 years ago. It was one of the first catering for Muslims. Tomorrow is only women. OK. We don't have any men here. OK. They'd fled from Iran after the revolution in 1979. They'd helped a Jewish family escape, and the secret police were after them. If, if, if we stay, so I, I was 100% sure uh, my husband come and me hang up. He would they would have hang. 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 I'm very, very sure. The only thing we had was the clothes that we wore. We walked four days to Turkey. What was your first impression when you got to Denmark? Uh, it, it was very good, uh, and people was very kind. They were to show us, you are in Denmark, you are safe, and you are with us, and we are, we are here and help you. Do you think that um, Denmark as a society has changed since then? From that time, yeah. They don't even accept us as Danish. But I feel I'm Danish. How does that make you feel, having lived here for 40 years? I feel I'm home, my country. Here is my country. I live in here. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe tomorrow is coming some low. We'll see. You are must going back. 
We don't know. Is that really what you think? Yeah. Yes. It's not only me. I know many people. Some. I didn't know she had an urge to become a Dane. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know she had, she wanted to be a Viking. <laughs> when do you feel Danish? What is Danish? What feeling do you have when you're Danish? Isn't it just getting along with people? Getting along with your neighbor? Isn't that being just a human being? What is it that is so important for us human beings that we feel like we have to claim a country and say, this is my place? I define myself as a, a kid, a great zone kid, because people like me are not accepted by the Danes and not accepted by the uh, Muslims or the Persians. So I make fun of all of this. So what has turned Denmark against people like Ellie and her mum? It wasn't just 9-11. When a Danish newspaper published cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad in 2005, causing riots to flare around the world, 200 people were killed and the violence shocked many Danes. It set the country on a very different course. I want to meet one man who is central to all of this, negotiating a lot of the new anti-immigrant laws. Martin Henriksen is spending summer at his farm. He was in Parliament for 15 years with the right-wing People's Party. Do you acknowledge that some Muslims that have lived here for a very long time, who are citizens, good upstanding citizens, now feel less welcome because of these policies? Well, basically, no. You don't basically, acknowledge no. that? No, I know that somebody has that feeling. Um, and I won't deny that people are having those feelings. But I actually think that debate is, is, is very strange because a lot of the debate is about how Muslims are feeling. I think the debate should be about how Danes are feeling about that they are treated like foreigners in some areas of their own countries. That is the debate that we should have. And what makes Denmark even more interesting is that it's not just the right-wing parties. A new Social Democrat government has just been elected. The left too is embracing these policies. Did this year's election in Denmark prove that you cannot win an election here, you cannot form government unless you convince the public that you're going to be tough on migrants and tough on Muslims? You have to be, um, you have to be tough on migration or you have to at least act like you're tough on migration. And that's one of the reasons why the Social Democrats have come into power, in my view. They and couldn't have won without doing that. I don't believe so. No, no, I don't believe so. This is Volsmosa. Officially, it's a ghetto, one of 29 across the country, with high migrant populations, low incomes and high crime rates. If you commit a crime here, you get double the punishment. Soon, a thousand families will be evicted and the homes demolished to promote integration. The boys at Volsmosa Boxing Club are trying to fight off that stigma. Ali is already a champion boxer. Yeah, I'm very, very proud. Because I made, I make my family, I make a lot of people who are proud of me, so I'm also proud. Do you like it here? I like it here, and I don't want to move in any place. But the politicians want to bulldoze this place. I know, yes, but another good idea. Why? Because I don't think it will help with the crime and violent. Can you? fix the problem by knocking down the buildings? No. We, we need to take these people that, that are criminal and uh, help them, not uh, take the old people in the uh, Vosmos. Do you think that everyone here is being punished 
ja, okay. for the crimes of a few. Ja. The extremist politician Rasmus Paludin pulled a few stunts at Volsmosa during the election campaign. So the boys have seen Denmark's new politics up close. He says to all people that we will never be a Danish innocent. And he said it to your face? To, 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 to my face or to the other, to my friends. So. Are you a citizen? Uh, yes, I am. I'm, I'm born in Denmark. You, how does that make you feel? Actually, I, I don't give a fuck because I met a lot of people like him uh, and I use it. Ali may challenge what many Danes think it looks like to be a Dane, but next week he'll do something that he thinks will prove the doubt is wrong. He's joining the Danish army. Do you think they want you to do this? They want no, you to no. Go I think I, I think I think Paladin uh, want to uh, want to show the people that we fallen down. And so you're doing the opposite. I, I do the opposite. I learned in the, I learned from boxing. What's that? That I will never fall down. Every, every time I fall down, I will stay up. Roll that. Yep. Rasmus Paludin may sit on the extreme, but he is shaping much of the political conversation. So I want to understand what he actually wants. You're without a doubt the most culturally Marxist journalist from elsewhere that I've ever met. It turns out this is less interview and more a repeat performance. Could you please take the 700,000 Muslims from Denmark that you love so much, just take them with you to your neighbourhood in Australia? I would be very much in your debt. What you should have done in those interviews, instead of being their complacent white slave, what you should have done is... No, this stuff dragged on for an hour or so, a torrent of abuse and hate speech. No There's no point in me telling you the facts because you'll just ignore them. And it turns out, well, it was a performance of sorts. He was recording the whole thing himself to put online and feed into the alt-right universe. He'd schooled an Australian journalist, apparently. But in truth, it was clearly about getting a reaction. And I will speak very highly of you, Hamish, forever. OK. Today, Ellie's recording a comedy pilot. Her character is being told not to use her Muslim name or her ghetto accent in her new job at a call centre. Ellie is using humour to navigate and explain this cultural divide. Like the call centre boss who wants the new arrival to fit neatly into the Danish way, this country is trying to figure out just how much change it can tolerate. It's something the country and the current crop of leaders is struggling to answer. Do you think Denmark needs today to find leaders that have that ability to communicate, to, to sort of bring the different tribes together? Of course I think that we need um, some the, we need some leaders in Denmark that can connect us, that can build bridges. That's like one of the main things. So the Danes are over here, the Muslims are over here, and they're kind of not really know, they don't really know how to communicate. Does it make sense? Yeah, like a modern day King Harold the Bluetooth. Yes. Is that you? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't think I'm a hard blood fan. <laughs> no. I'm just me. Just crazy Persian, Dane, whatever. <laughs>